with a shrink shop depth session. The depth sessions are where we go more in depth into certain topics to help you step up the quality of your life and welcome. And so my name is Mike Boyle and today we're gonna to be talking about uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It's a popular uh, mode of therapy that has been become popularized in lots of different circles. And I really love it because for those of us that are like do, do it yourselfers, for those of us that are really want practical tools in order to make our lives better, and we don't necessarily want to get bogged down in some of the therapy styles in which we are trying to figure out our past or have insights or talk about, you know, how things were in the past or things like that, then this is more, this is, this is a very proactive um, solution based model that I really like. So we all need a little uh, DBT itself in general has four different modules. D um, one of them is distress tolerance, and that's what we're going to talk about today because I think that we all need it. A little bit of a uh, thank you. Uh, hey, hey, Joey, right on, man. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for joining and letting me know that I'm on. So DBT, distress tolerance. Um, we all need a little bit of distress tolerance right now, I think. So the core concept for this DBT, for this DBT um, module is that distress tolerance helps us cope with crisis without making our situation worse. And the first thing I want to talk about is, a, is this term stress, right? So we, we have, it's become kind of a, a term that has been used or maybe even overused in our cultural trance, which is like, oh, I'm so stressed out or life is so stressful. And, and stress has become this enemy. Even medical doctors are telling us stress kills and, and we have all these things. But really the original research, the original science that started the whole stress thing was started by a guy named Hans Selye. And Hans Selye was a German, uh, a German and scientist who, who was studying, who was studying stress, right? But, but really something was lost in translation because he differentiated in his original work there's a difference and, and something was lost in translation because he talked about distress and eustress. But somehow our, in our cultural parlance, we just talk about stress in general and we don't make this differentiation. And this differentiation is really important. So distress versus eustress, where distress is kind of like crisis and it is stuff that is genuinely things that we want to minimize, avoid, um, move through, get away from, but you stress is actually imperative for life. And a simple example of you stress is, you know, you go to the gym and your muscles tear in order to grow bigger. Well, of course that's, that is a stress on your muscles, but it's a stress that is helping you grow, helping you thrive. Distress is often more associated with the potential for trauma and toxicity in ways that is going to break us down. Of course, um, we all are going to face distress in our life, so it doesn't have to be that way. Nothing is set in stone, but we are able to, we, we're going to have to work with those things with a little bit different um, approach in order to not have those distressing times become our norm or have them lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, or these types of things that can actually really cause long-term damage. So today we are gonna talk about distress tolerance because distress is something that we're all facing to a certain degree in our lives. And particularly things are kind of ramping up, you know, with, with COVID and alienation and isolation and worries and concerns. And so there's a lot of people that are struggling right now. And I certainly have had my struggles in these last couple of months uh, and, and we live in pretty, pretty sweet and ideal circumstances in terms of being able to get outside and being able to, you know, really have some, some nice advantages that I, that I admit are advantages, but people right now, you know, are, are in cities and are isolated and don't have a lot of places to go, or maybe you're, you do live remotely and you're, and you don't, don't have a lot of personal contact and things might feel pretty distressing, um, 
And so that's why I wanted to talk about distress tolerance today. So I'm going to be borrowing a lot from a book that I'm looking down at, and it's a book called, um, let me see what the exact title is. I'll show, even show it to you. It's called The Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Skills Training Manual uh, by Lane Peterson. And Lane is an awesome, an awesome uh, teacher of dialectical behavioral therapy. He's who I studied with in order to become certified in dialectical behavioral therapy. And I highly, highly recommend his work. This book is available on Amazon um, if you would like to pick it up for yourself. And here's another thing that is sometimes a little bit controversial uh, maybe about me and my approach is that I kind of give, give, give people the goods. I give people the secrets. I, you know, and other therapists might think, oh, wow, you're, you know, you're, you're teaching them a lot of the stuff that I want to be able to teach them so that I can keep my job. And I say, well, my job is to work myself out of a job and, and I'm a do it, do it yourself or in terms of improving my life. And so you might be too. And so there's a lot of things that you can learn on your own that you can take to make your life a better place to live. And you don't necessarily need, in fact, any, any good therapist is going to be one that is fostering your independence as soon as possible, just like a good teacher or a good parent. And so uh, my job is to work myself out of a job. And one of the ways that I do that is teaching you the things that I learned in school and, uh, and I've learned in my professional training that are, you know, stuff that you definitely can implement on your own. It's not to say that there is not a time and a place for the therapeutic relationship. It can be a really awesome thing. Obviously, uh, I wouldn't do the job that I do if I didn't believe that. I've also been in those therapeutic relationships myself and have been through therapy and things like that. So it can be, it can be invaluable, but there's also a ton you can learn on your own. So distress tolerance. As I look down at the manual here, I'm going to also add in some of the some of my own flavors and things like that. But I really appreciate Lane and Lane's writing style and his teaching style is fantastic. So thanks, Lane, if you're out there, uh, please check out his work, Lane Peterson. Um, so we sometimes cope with intense emotions, Lane says, in ways that make our situation worse or cause us to neglect our long term priorities, goals and values. Anyone ever done that? You ever cope with the intense situation or intense emotions or difficult times in ways that are counterproductive that make it worse? Of course, on the obvious end of the spectrum, we have drinking, we have drugs, we have self-harm, we have things like this, but even on a maybe on a on a harm reduction scale that is lower towards the the le less harmful end, we have overeating, we have although overeating can become seriously problematic and cause us lots of health problems. We have avoidance, we have, um, we have, you know, numbing out on Netflix, you know, these are, these are things that are actually, they're distractions from our pain and from our suffering, but they're the type of distractions that actually often lead to more, uh, a downward spiral, a shame spiral. We feel bad about ourselves. We feel, when we feel bad about ourselves, then we go more to the coping, the, to the numbing behaviors. And then it, 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 things spiral out of control and we get off track from our goals, our values and our priorities. And really one of the DBT maxims that I like is we talk about creating a life worth living. And the, and the most important word there is creating, right? And so we, there is so much that we can do no matter what has happened to us in our past. There's so much that we can do to create better life circumstances. And uh, that's a big part of what I like to talk about with people and what you've noticed in these videos. But by the way, if you like these videos, please share them, please like them, please do all that stuff. There is a link in the description to my YouTube channel. Please go and subscribe there. That's a way that you can help me help others because the more, uh, the more I'm able to kind of build that audience and traffic, the more we're able to get these tools out to people. And that's really the end game is, is, to, is to help as many people as we can and um, and to share our struggles together and to try to find a, a sense of community and connection in times when we all are feeling a little bit isolated right now. So, so distress tolerance skills provide alternatives to help us cope in the short term without making our situation worse. And they keep us in line with our priorities, values, and goals. So this, this, whole, this whole module of skills in DBT is 
in a certain sense about healthy distractions. It is about realizing, wow, I am on fire right now and I'm not, and, and I'm really tempted to make some diff some choices that aren't going to be uh, so healthy and positive for me. I need to work with this, but I still can't quite get into a place where I'm absolutely um, thriving or solving this problem. You know, I'm really in the middle of a difficult situation and I need some tools to help me just stay, stay sane and kind of punt, punt the ball down, down the field a little bit so that I can pick it up at a later date and then, and really take, take charge back again. Okay. So having a plan is really important. Having a bunch of tools in your toolbox is really important. Because when we get in these modes, we often don't think, we react. We often don't respond, we react. And when we react, we are using the survival part of the brain. As we've talked about in the past, we've talked about the three, the, the fight, flight, or freeze mode, the surviving brain. Well, the surviving brain, when we are in fight, flight, or freeze, so fight, anger, flight, fear, freeze, numbness, depression, hopelessness, helplessness. So... When we're in one of those modes, we are automatically going to be considering the world as either predator or competitor, and we have a very limited range of strategies. That part of the brain literally shuts down our thinking rational mind, because if I'm in survival mode, then according to my brain, what it means is that my brain thinks that there is an immediate, right now, life or death threat. Oftentimes, that's not the case. There might be something distressing going on in our life. There might be something difficult going on in our life. You know, we might even be kind of really having a hard time with the isolation of COVID or whatnot. But this is more like there's a tiger at my throat or there's a gun at my head. And pardon me if either of those are triggering th things for you to think about. But so the brain goes, oh, I'm in danger. I'm in immediate danger. So it limits. So it shuts down thinking capacity. It such, shuts down the higher parts of our brain that can think outside the box or think creatively or resourcefully or problem solve. It shuts down the part of our nervous system that is responsible for immune system and healing and thriving and feeling happiness and love and connection. So the survival part of the brain does not care about us being happy. It does not care about us feeling love. It does not care about us enjoying things. It only cares about survival. So it, and it will shunt all of the resources away from those things that we really would prefer to experience. And it moves them, it, it puts them on the back burner and puts on the front burner, fighting, running away, hiding. Fight, flight, freeze, okay? So, it's really what we're trying to do here is then create when we create a plan that is using this upper part of the brain, our prefrontal lobe, and we're injecting in there prefrontal lobe activities. We're going to inject in there questions, ways to activate the higher part of our nervous system when we're in the middle of distress so that we can bring that human part, higher thinking part of the brain back online so that we can make better decisions so that we can actually work ourselves out of difficult situations, cope with them more effectively, and eventually thrive even though bad stuff or difficult stuff is happening in our life, okay? So we can take a look at our, hist our history, you know? We can take a look and we can it purposely go and say, yeah, well, these are the things that tend, tend to tip typically trip my wire. You know, it's not rocket science. We, we don't need to think about the, the big surprises right now you know, maybe that's a little bit more of an advanced capacity in distress tolerance, but we are often in a state of distress with our regular everyday life circumstances, you know, feeling overwhelmed about the house, the mess in the house, feeling overwhelmed about, you know, parenting with homeschool kids, you know, with, um, with kids that are at school online right now. We're in a state of distress on a regular basis. Now, remember, I'm saying, we're in a state of distress, not in a state of eustress. And we can move, if we can move ourselves into a state of eustress where, I, where I'm saying, this is an opportunity for me to grow and thrive. This is one of the key components between whether or not something is distressing and whether or not something is eustress is our mindset. And when we think about, when we consider that our situation is overwhelming, 
then we are going to be more in a state of distress. And that is going to be generating neurology, biology, chemistry that is that has a toxic influence in our life. It is going to make things worse, not better. But when we say, oh, this situation is a challenge, this is an opportunity for me to grow, then we are gonna be more on the eustress side and we are gonna activate the part of our nervous system that is gonna gear us up for a challenge and is gonna actually help us thrive in the long run. So that mindset difference, and I talk about that in, 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 in previous videos, you can look on my YouTube channel and there's, there's a video called The Difference Between Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and Post-Traumatic Growth. And, and put the difference between the two, whether or not one goes through a difficult experience and develops post-traumatic stress disorder, and whether or not one goes through a difficult experience and, de and develops post-traumatic growth symptoms, which is that they actually become smarter, better, healthier, happier because of the adversity. The big difference is, is whether or not we feel that situation is overwhelming or whether and it is a threat or whether or not we feel that situation is a challenge and an opportunity. And that we have the ability to influence our mindset by the way we think about things, by the way we perceive them, by the things that we tell ourselves. I'm listening to a book on Audible right now, <clears throat> and excuse me because it's, uh, it's the, the, the title has profanity in it, but I'm gonna go for it. I'll take a chance that you guys are all right with that. It's called Unfuck Yourself, How to Unfuck Yourself. And, uh, and it's cool. It's, you know, the, the, the audible version is writ is read by the author and he's a Scottish guy and he's got a funny accent and he's just got a kind of a cut through approach. But really what he's saying, his gist is, is that the way that we talk to ourselves about our situation is absolutely key because when we think we create emotion, those emotions are chemicals. Every single time you think a thought, you create neurological activity. That neurological activity then creates chemical activity. Those chemicals then course through our body and literally create our body and our experience and our perception. And so if I sit there and go, oh, I hate doing the dishes, this sucks, this is awful. Well, then I'm creating distressing chemicals and they're coursing through my veins. And that literally, and then we wonder, you know, when we, you know, over time, when dis-ease happens, you know, heart problems or high blood pressure or things like that, or, 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 you know, then we wonder where did that stuff come from? Well, it comes from day in and day out resisting and kind of telling ourselves a story about how awful our situation is. Now, if you are really in the midst of a traumatic or, or experience that is actually life-threatening, this is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the way in which on a day-to-day -day basis, we tell ourselves how awful our situation is. We put ourselves into survival, life or death, fight, flight, or freeze mode about things like doing the dishes or, you know, vacuuming or whatever, or folding laundry, you know, and I'm maybe being a little cheeky, maybe it's not that quite that innocuous, but oftentimes it really is. And we knew, and so this guy in, in the go fuck yourself, go, <laughs> in the unfuck yourself book say is basically talking about really, really paying attention and, and cutting through that inner dialogue, that inner monologue where we are telling ourselves how awful our situation is. In, in cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, we talk about, we call this awfulizing or terribleizing or horribleizing or catastrophizing, right? Oh man, I hate this. You know, I see my kids and I'm, I've been working with my kids with it in the last couple of days because, you know, hey, please go make your bed. Oh, oh, oh my God, right? And that communication, that inner communication, he's in that moment, my son is now putting toxic chemicals through his body about something as easy as pulling a sheet up on his bed, right? And we do this all the time and we wonder why we're exhausted. Well, and I talked to him about this is like, that's like having a hole in your gas tank. You're using survival energy, the most expensive energy that a human being has. You're using fight, anger, flight, fear, or freeze, hopelessness, depression, numbness. You're using this absolute, these expensive chemicals 
on things that are not worth that type of reaction. And, and then we wonder why we are exhausted, why we're sick and tired, why we don't feel great, right? Because we're doing this on a day in day out basis. So that was a little bit of a tangent that I actually didn't even mean to go on, but I think it's all useful stuff. But so back to the lesson on distress tolerance, because this is when, you know, when we really are feeling distressed, we need to find, uh, we need to find those cues where we get in these distressed states and, and we can create a plan and we can have a list of tools that we use that we, that I know this is a good way for me to get out of this, to settle my nervous system down, to get myself in a better state of mind, to get myself in a better state of being, excuse me, oh. sorry about that. Um, let me take a little break here and I have all sorts of things coming in on my computer, clicking in at me, trying to get at me. This is another thing we get. We live in a culture of such super stimulation that even that can be distressing. So take a breath. Here we are. We have a few more minutes left. Distress tolerance is used when we cannot solve a problem. This is the key. There are things in our life that we cannot solve. In the spiritual work system that I practice, we call this the gym. When I have a gym, a gym, the gym is the the gym is is when I have a situation in my life that I cannot fix or solve, but I can grow my spiritual and psychological muscles against the resistance of it. So, COVID, it's happening. Whether you believe in it, whether you don't believe it, no matter what, it's impacting everyone. Everyone's reacting to it. It is impacting our economy. It's impacting our communities. It's impacting our quality of life. And it's not going away anytime soon, okay? You know, whatever. Hopefully in the relative scheme of things, you know, there will be some much improved scenarios coming coming at us. But still, we're in this for a little while still. And so that's the gym. Is this, is um, Am I going to look at that as an overwhelming threat? Or am I going to look at that as an opportunity to grow and thrive? Distress tolerance skills kind of help us when we're in the middle and we're kind of looking at it like an overwhelming threat and we need to cope with that distress in a way that does not make things worse so that we can get ourselves back to the use stress model and thriving even though difficult stuff is happening. So three questions that we ask ourselves. Here's some practical things. Three questions. Am I able to solve the problem? Yes or no? If no, we're going to use distress tolerance and we're going to get to the skills this time or maybe even next time. Is it an okay time for me to solve the problem? Yes or no? If no, use distress tolerance. Am I in a good state of mind to be able to solve the problem? Yes or no? If no, use distress tolerance. So if you answer yes to all three questions, am I able to solve the problem? Is it an okay time to solve the problem? And am I in a good state of mind to solve the problem? Then by all means solve the problem because avoiding and distracting yourself from the problem is going to lead to that procrastination effect where things just pile up and get worse. So I'm absolutely advocating for a head on, meet the problem, take care of it if you can. But if you can't, and there will always be times in our life, there will often be times in our life where we either can't solve the problem, we can't solve the problem right now, or we're not in the right frame of mind to solve the problem. That is when we want to use distress tolerance skills. Okay? So the first distress tolerance skill is something that we've talked about in these videos, and it's something that I call a portable pause. And this is a term that I learned from a mentor of mine. A portable pause is the ability to recognize that I'm in a state of distress and to do something that is going to pause my situation so that I can make a different choice. Instead of just, you know, the proverbial knee jerk reaction, I am going to pause so that I can respond to the situation, right? So the portable pause comes from what we call extra and open attention. Extra attention, does anyone remember? Extra attention is the practice of being aware of the sensations in my body, the aliveness in my body. Open attention is being aware of the situational awareness all around me. So when I do this, when I, and so this is kind of like a portable meditation 
state. So when I just, so say I'm distressed and I, and I have a moment and I just go and I check in and I say, and I just feel, where do I notice it in my body? And I feel the aliveness in my body and I maybe take a breath. It can help to hold my breath for a minute, maybe not a full minute, but you know what I mean? And then, and then I'm aware of the visceral space all around my body. I'm aware of the visceral sensations in my body and the space all around my body, not the story about what is going on about that I'm distressed about. That distress is almost always a story. Remember, I hate doing the dishes or I hate, or, oh, COVID is so awful. I'm so alone. I'm so isolated. That story, the more we are entertaining that inner monologue, the more we are going to create the distressing emotions. So this portable pause is a way of dissociating from the story that is causing us to suffer so much. And we are distracting ourselves actually from the suffering story by getting very much in touch with our present moment, real circumstances, body on the chair, space around me, space of this room, the colors that I'm noticing, the textures, the feeling the clothes on my skin, the air on my skin, feeling the breath coming in and out of my lungs, really getting viscerally involved and engaged in my sensations of life, not in the emotions, not in the stories, but in the visceral sensations of the here and now and the present moment. When I do that, I'm going to send a clear message to my brain, to my nervous system that I'm actually safe. I'm in danger. I don't need to be in fight, flight, or freeze. Okay. And so with that portable pause, I'm going to start to settle my nervous system down right away. And then I can start to choose. Then I can start to choose differently. And I can start to, you know, choose different activities, right? So now DBT has these cool things and they're, you know, they're basically these acronyms where they, where, where you have all these tools built into an acronym. So say, for example, we distract with accepts, accepts, A C C E P T S accepts is activities, a contributing C comparisons, C emotions, E push away P thoughts, T sensations, S that might be a little hard to follow on this format, but we're going to go through that next time. And next time we're going to go through the accepts model of all these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that we can do when we're in a distressing situation that we can kind of get ourselves settled down so that we can make a better choice so that we can respond to the situation instead of react to it so that we can cope, but healthy cope. So again, coping is, 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 is actually healthy and intentional distraction from the problem, distraction from the suffering, because for whatever reason, we can't solve the problem in the exact moment, in the exact state of mind that we are in. So we're going to use accept activities, contributing, comparing ourselves, comparing the situation to other times that we've thrived in our life. We're going to use uh, we're going to cultivate purposefully emotion, different emotions. We're going to use skills like opposite to emotion, where we're going to do the opposite of what we feel just as an exercise, right? Because we're in charge of our emotions, right? And so a lot of times we don't, we don't know that to be the case. So we're going to use a skill called pushing away. Pushing away is basically getting distance, psychological distance from our problems. We're going to use, um, uh, some thought strategies. And we're going to use uh, some exercises that help us get involved in the sensations in our body. So next time we meet together, we're going to be a continuation from distress tolerance. And we're going to go into the accepts tools. Okay. So my name is Mike and we are in the shrink shop depth sessions. We're talking about DBT and distress tolerance. We're talking about the difference between distress and eustress. We're talking about practical things that you can do to make your life a better place to live. We're going to be here every week, usually on Mondays at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Every once in a while that gets changed because life happens to me too. But usually it's Mondays at 10 a.m. And you're maybe watching this uh, from a different place or maybe you're watching the recording. If you're live, I want you to know that I'm here for the next 30 minutes to answer questions. 
So please submit your questions, write in, let us know how this can be relevant to you. Let us know how this works or doesn't work in your life, how we can troubleshoot. And, uh, and hopefully that is a tool for you that you can understand is gonna be there every time. It's gonna be there. So a 30 minute lesson, 30 minute q and I'm around, hanging around my computer, available to answer questions and get your feedback about how, what I might talk about the next week or maybe the week after that. So once again, Love you all. Have a wonderful day. We're at our 30 minute mark and thanks for joining and please subscribe to the YouTube channel and all those things. Share the videos if they're helpful for you and let's spread the love. Love you all. Bye.